Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Bible says in John chapter 17, Jesus made a statement, Sanctify them through thy truth, and thy word is truth. Well, we back up. Let's, let's just back. And th this is not the scripture he gave me, but man. Let's look at verse 14. John chapter 17, verse 14. Y'all extend me a little grace today. At, uh, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. My, 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 my. Watch out if everybody loves you. You might not have the word. He said, I give them your word, and the, and the world hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of this world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Amen. Thy word is true. Amen. They are not of the world system, but we are kingdom people. I like last night, I saw a little uh, clip um, that I guess one of the news channels or something, they filmed the parade yesterday and they were showing the floats coming by. And <laughs> uh, um, naturally, Joe was making his debut. <laughs> but it was funny because, and I don't know what channel was it, you know? Did, did, did you see anybody see that when they, they were showing the float? It's a, just a small segment. But they actually showed our float. And as it was coming by, the guy and the lady, were, I guess they filmed the whole parade and they made a statement. Wow, advancing the kingdom. And the guy says, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Advance the kingdom. And Joe yells out, glory to God, praise Jesus on the float. And he's, yes, um, we're supposed to praise Jesus. It was like it was odd, you know. So, but they did brag on the float. So good job on the, they did. They were made of, but we live in a society now to mention the name of Jesus, you feel funny. Well, y'all, don't be stiff on me this morning because I'm telling you, it's been a long week. Just work with me. If you don't, just act and fake it if you have to. Just fake through it. Come on, I know you can do that. <laughs> Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Well, he's establishing here the truth is God's word. Now, we live in a society that has distorted a lot of God's Word, and we've misquoted and, and been mistaught through the years of God's Word. Most of us, if not all of us, believe God is, we, we say He's for us, but really down deep, you don't think God's for you. We have this mentality that we make God angry with our thoughts or our actions or certain things that we do, that we go through this whole condemnation thing if we make a mistake, we go through this whole self-condemnation thing that our whole week is shot. Now, I don't mean that. Now, some people, the Bible even speaks of that their heart has been seared, that their conscience has been seared, that the, the Word of God means nothing to them. Wrong and right, there's no wrong and right to people in the world today. Everything that they choose to be right is right, even though it can be blatantly wrong. They got a, a word for that called narcissism. It's all about me. And how I see it and how it's supposed to be. No matter what around you in the Word of God says, you deem it what you want to fit how you think it should be to fit your lifestyle. 
But those of us that are true, that the Word of God means something. And when you make a mistake, and we all do, we all do. We all do. We all do. <laughs> we all do. Amen. And it's okay. Nobody will look, because, because if you got a good Christian beside you, if you say, well, we all make a mistake, and you say, amen, preacher, they say, well, what did you do this week? They want to know what, what mistake you made. They're not concerned about the grace. They want to know how you messed it up. That's busybodies. <laughs> I'll go ahead and tell you, I messed up this week. I'm not going to tell you what I did, but I have. Uh, does that mean you won't come back to the church? That's up to you. <laughs> but I'd be a fool to stand up and tell you that, hey, man, I never blow it. Huh? I am righteous. So are you, those of you who are born again. The Bible says you've been made righteous by the righteousness of Christ Jesus. I've been made righteous. And now I choose to live a holy life unto the Lord as I grow from day to day, grace to grace, faith to faith. It changes me that I grow in those areas. But have I arrived? No. No. So he tells us that the word, the sanctifying is by the word, the word of truth. Now let's I want to turn to the scripture of, that God gave me, 1 Timothy Chapter 1. Holy Spirit, help me. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Glory to God. And I heard a wonderful, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it just reminded me of Christ and what he's done for us. There was a farmer that lost his, um, his, his barn burnt down. Had a big fire. I don't know if it was some sort of brush fire that swept across the area and uh, consumed his barn and a lot of his farm animals. Everything got burnt up. You ever been anywhere where everything's burnt up? And he was walking around checking all the damage and looking at everything he had lost. And he went by and was walking through the barn and he saw where one of the hens was laying there burnt because he lost a lot of his animals, livestock in the barn. But as he looked at it, he saw her wings spread out laying there. And she had, when the fire came, dug a hole as deep as she could and put her biddies under her. And they, were, and they began to come out one by one. Is that not what the Lord has done for us? He covered us when the fire came, when the storm rages. He took his wings. The Bible says in Psalms, he covers us with his feathers. How many of you can give thanks to God, if not for God? If not for God, you wouldn't be looking me eye to eye today, but he covered you when you didn't deserve to be covered. Uh, he, he puts you in a safe place when really in yourself, you didn't, you didn't deserve a safe place. But God said, I created you and made you in my image and I love you regardless. Uh, is that not a good father? Just like a parents, you know, we say sometimes you hear parents say, well, that's my good kid and that's my bad one there. That's my rebellious one and that's my one's going to Harvard. But Mess around and mess with the rebellious one and see don't they treat it just like the one that's going to Harvard. They still, that's still my baby. And that's what we do as parents. God does not judge us compared to another person. He created you individually, unique. You're who you are. You don't have to be judged by anybody else. And as long as we walk by the word of God, it says it sanctifies us and brings us to truth. Why would the enemy in the time we're living in and has for centuries try to distort the Bible so that it can be turned from truth to a gray area that we now begin to live a lie without power, without dominion, 
without joy, without healing, without access to all that heaven offers, the enemy slowly but surely begins to shut down that avenue because he tries to distort the word. And sad to say, through religious mouths and preachers that choose to uh, uh, indoctrinate you with what we call doctrine of demons. Again, walk with me a little bit today because I don't have some great, these are all jots and tittles here. And we know we've heard, you've heard, well, healing's not for everybody. Speaking in tongues is not for everybody. Prosperity is not for everybody. God's not going to bless everything. But he's the blesser, not the curser. God, the Bible says God's a blesser and not the curser. So if he can distort his, if, if the enemy can distort the word of the Lord in our mouth, we begin to self-curse ourselves. Hmm? We begin to say things. I'll, I'll never do this. I'll never be able to do that. I'll never get better. You know, my wife and I have to constantly every day say, we're going to get past this. Amen. Every day, we're going to get past it. Amen. This morning when I got up and the scripture was on, my, I kept hearing, you know, certain people say, are you okay? I don't know what that means, really and truly. How do you answer, are you Okay. I think it's become a measuring line just to be, try to be polite. I'm just acknowledging, are you okay? But I really, it does, you know, what are you going through doesn't affect me. We've turned it into just a calling card. But how do you determine when you ask somebody who's been through tragedy, are you okay today? How are you feeling today? Well, my Lord, you know, we, we could spill our guts. But in the natural, no, we're not Okay. Supernatural, I'm going just fine. In my, in my flesh, not too good. But in my born-again spirit, I'm soaring. And I'm just getting the two in alignment. Amen? Because I've learned through the years to sanctify myself through the truth. Because truth will keep you in the world we live in. And the things that you face. I thank God for this church. I thank God for you, and it's come with a great price. This, what you see today has come with a great price. But in the middle of paying a price, we have to ask ourselves, am I doing it for the king or am I doing it for me? Nothing you see here today have I ever done for myself. If it was for me, I might make you mad, but I would, the day would be my last sermon. But it's not for me. So there's, you, you can't just walk away from a, a God-ordained moment that's for the King Christ Jesus. And I want to tell you, church, there'll be things you do in this life that maybe will never be recognized. But I promise you the day will come when the recognition will come from God. Where he will thank you for the things, the hours, the money, the time you sowed into people's lives. Because in order to excel in this life, I found out you first got to get involved with somebody else's life. Amen. Amen. We have to get involved with somebody else's dream, somebody else's desires, and help build. I mean, for the, I'm not talking secular. I'm talking kingdom purposes that each one of you have on your life this morning, a kingdom call. One of the guy that done a lot of our cooking yesterday, I thanked him uh, for cooking. I said, you have a gift. He said, well, it takes all of us. I said, yeah. He said, well, my gift's not as big. I said, every gift counts. I said, without your gift to do what you're doing, I said, this thing could not happen. I realize others had to come along and do their part, but every one, the Bible says we're fitly joint together. If I take that joint right there off of this pinky finger, I got problems. This thing won't work right. And when I, if you reach and t cut, take this off, the, all the way over here, I bet I can feel the pain in this hand, you know. That joint right there matters to my hand. And this hand matters to this arm. And this arm matters to this body. And the Bible goes on to say, and we don't even count the internal things that we call, because you don't see your heart and your lungs and your kidneys. But he said the things that you don't see are even more important. What about everybody in the body of Christ that says, well, I've gone unnoticed, but you hadn't. You are greatly important in the kingdom of God. Because without a heart, there's no you. Every joint fit together, it says, serves the other part of the body. That's what we do. 
And in order to do that, we have to learn to sanctify ourselves through the Word. In 1 Timothy verse 12, Paul said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now he goes on to give his accolades. Who before was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was injurious, but I obtained mercy. Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Whether you know it or not, you've been abundantly given grace through Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exceptions. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul said, "Who I'm a, I was a chief. That's pretty, that's, you're pretty good when you're ahead of everybody sinning. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God be honor, glory forever and ever. Amen. Then he goes on to Timothy and says, This charge I commit unto you, son, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went, went before on you, that thou mightest war a good warfare. Now when he's talking about prophecies, he's talking about things he spoke to Timothy and his grandmother and different ones that were born again and walking with the Lord. They said things to this young man. Sadly to say, most of us has had word curses spoke over us. And today I really believe we're going to break some of those. Some of us have been told what we can't do and how stupid we are and how dumb we are. And we'll always be a drunk and a drug dealer and a prostitute and a whore. Mother. All the things that your family did. That's all we know is our family name. Get away from your family name. You got a new name. You got a new blood. You got a new inheritance. You got a new, you an heir and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. You're under the blessing of Abraham, but we hang on to this name thing. Believe me, I know it all too well. <laughs> I fought very hard to shuck off some of the types and shadows. And still, they're not gone. I can sit down with the best of them and say, yeah, but you know. We expect it from you because you're a Davis. Well, that's good. That's all right. But I love to ask them, well, what is your last name? Whether it be Jones or Johnson or Raven or Timbuktu or whatever they want to call themselves. I say, well, all of y'all Timbuktu's together. What have you done for the kingdom of God? All of you. Get all your family together. What have y'all done for the kingdom of God? Well, I, I, my grandmother was good. I didn't ask you how good you were. I asked you, what have you done for the kingdom of God that's changed lives? That you allowed yourself to be sanctified through the truth and that the truth separated you from the world. Get all your bloodline together and let's stand together and show me the evidence of how good they are but in Christ Jesus. They couldn't fill up a thimble. But you ever notice people that go forth with Christ get the most slack? Think about it. Think about Jesus. Why was he getting so much slack? The man come producing. The man come teaching the kingdom. The man come healing people, feeding people, setting people free. And they, all the, all the religious crowd could say, he broke our laws. He broke the law. He broke the law. We got the creed on the back of the church that says what we believe in. We don't believe in divorced people. We don't believe blacks and whites should be together. We don't believe Mexicans should be. I mean, we got all kind of creeds on the back of churches today. Huh? If you've been married and divorced, you can't vote, but yet you want my tithe. Does that make any sense? You want my money, but you don't want to see me. Oh, y'all getting stiff on me. Y'all getting stiff. Boy, I felt that tighten up. Huh? Huh? 
Nah, you've been, you know, you know, and I, <laughs> hallelujah. It goes back to the message I preached a few weeks ago. When you've been in the pit on a snowy day with a line and you come out through the victory of Christ Jesus and anointing the Lord, you don't care what other people say when it comes to the gospel. You get on with the getting on. You make the thing happen. You just keep doing what God has called you to do. Hmm? Glory to God. He says, I charge you to wage a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. Verse 19. Which some have put away concerning faith and made shipwreck. So this is telling me I can take in truth and then I can begin to distort truth and put it away and shipwreck my very faith in my very life. Are you with me? Does the Bible not say that the, the, when the word comes, the word of the kingdom comes, the enemy comes immediately to steal it so that you don't be able to bear fruit or put down roots and grow? Huh? I know there's people sitting in here today that you've heard about this church before you come and you've heard about this preacher before you come and you, what you heard was lies and fabricated stuff and you say, well, we don't believe like that. Have, since you've been coming, have you heard anything contrary to this Bible when I stand up here and preach to you? After all, I'm deemed a snake handler in my community, which I live among snakes over there. Holding faith. Well, you got to first know what your faith is. What is my faith? No word, no faith. No word, no faith. Huh? You got people today believe that trees is the reason we're here. And tadpoles is where we come from. And monkeys is how we were made. And an asteroid hit and all of a sudden we, I mean, there's so many scientific lies and they can't prove a one of them. Amen. Not one has been proven. Yeah, but my friend, they believe that way, and we go out and have caviar and cocktails, and I don't want to offend them. Well, you, you need to just go on and do what they're doing, because if you abide with them, that means that you believe the way they do. You need to present the truth sometime. Well, I'll lose my friend. Let me go ahead and tell you, they're not your friend. <laughs> they're not your friend. Lose your money and the car and the house, you will lose your buddies. Hmm? We work very hard to keep up an image. The Bible says we should have the image of Christ Jesus before us constantly. Hebrews 12, 2, the author and finisher of our faith. But this morning, this scripture in verse 12, he said, I thank Christ Jesus who enabled me for he counted me faithful. He counted me faithful. This thing rolled over in my spirit for three hours this morning. I said, what? You know, you begin, Holy Spirit, what? Paul said he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. When did he count him faithful? The day he made him. The day he made him. He went on to call Paul a chosen vessel. He said, he's my chosen vessel. Now, you just read, he, this man went in homes and pulled children out and murdered their mother and father in front of them, and he incarcerated them, put them in a halfway house. He stoned people in the streets. He tracked sinners down, uh, Christians down, and murdered constantly. And today's society, you can say what you want about reading the Bible, but if Paul was here today and got saved, you would not listen to him preach. And he says, the Lord counted me faithful that he put me in the ministry. So you have to ask God, when did you count this man? When did you count me? When did you count you? The day he said that I thought about you is when I counted. And remember, God says, I know the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. A day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. There's no time limit in God. And when he goes on to say, Paul was my chosen vessel, you ever been to anyone's shop that makes pottery or different crafts and you see one they always keep in the back or something? They're prototype, what we call our prototype. 
You, you can't buy that one. That's what started me. And they'll see, you'll see the little jar and it'll have number one on it. Yeah, even today with cars, you think back, uh, uh, Shelby, Mustangs, you get the one with the serial number one, that's, that's the one everybody wants, but you're going to cost you a million dollars to get it. Now, you can get any of them today, but you can't get that one other than you pay high money for that number one prototype that was made. I have to ask you, that's you. You're the only one God made like you. And I'm going to tell you, he counted you worthy and he counted you faithful. This is how God operates. He counted you faithful when you weren't faithful. He counted you worthy when you didn't think you were worthy. He counted you whole when you weren't whole. He called you. The Bible goes on. Jeremiah says he called me from my mother's womb and he formed and fashioned me. And in my inner parts, he made before a day ever come in my life. God knew exactly what I was going to do. And there comes a time in our lives that we have to answer that call. We have to answer it. And my job today is to let you know there's more preachers in this house. There's more apostles and prophets and evangelists. There's all kind of ministries sitting before me today. And we have to break off the ties of religion to get you to see I'm better than what I am right now. I can do this thing. But we'll always resort back to where we used to go or back to how we used to think or back to the preacher on the radio. I'm telling you, if it contradicts truth, kick it out. I get invited to places, oh, you ought to come hear this preacher, you ought to come hear that preacher. I'll ask the Lord, do I go? No, don't go. It's not because I'm better than them. But I've been to places before to preach the gospel. I left out of there. It took me a week to get over it. To pray the slime off of me. Huh? One of my uh, elders last night, just by we were riding the bikes, he said, man, I called him. I said, how you doing? He said, I just feel slime. I said, you're growing. He said, I feel slime, preacher. I said, that means you're growing. Because when you start feeling, when you get around certain things and certain places and it feels nasty when you leave, that means you're growing from faith to faith like I don't need that no more. Paul said, I counted all that as loss to obtain Christ Jesus. And that sensitivity of the Holy Spirit would get more and more real to you. And when you get around things that don't feed him, you leave out of there and you feel like something's been poured all over you, which is called the world system and the world's ways and demonic influence. And you come out and you have to go in your secret place and pray that stuff off of you. Do you understand that? But those of us say, well, I'm saved and I go in. How, 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 woo, woo, this is wonderful. Wow, this is a great club. Bam. And we come out of there and we go to church. I, I, went, I went out last night. Everything's cool, man. I'm saved. I'm born again. God forgives all sin. Once saved, always saved. I can't never go to hell anymore. You want to hang out with me Friday night? You have not grown. Doesn't mean you're unsaved means you're still a babe in Christ and you're the sensitivity to the, to the Holy Spirit. Now, now, I'm not saying we'd be rigid. We had a lot of people didn't come to our poker run yesterday because it's, we, they ding we stopped at beer joints. Do you know anybody? The IGA serves beer. Do you know anywhere you go in don't serve alcoholic beverages today? So they wouldn't show up. Well, I hope they make it into heaven because that made them holy. You know, I didn't go on the poker run and stop at no beer joint. I better not. If I see them at Applebee's today, I'm going to say, you better get out. You're going to hell. You better run. If you at uh, El Cerro, you better run. You're going to hell, son. Is that not true? Or are we just trying to make it what we want? If you can't eat it one, don't eat it the other. All of them will put you in hell. You out of your mind? I can eat anywhere I choose. I'm not going to hell because of where I eat. And I do want to say something about the last stop we had because it was a full blown beer joint. I mean, I, I held the door most of the time just, and it looked like the place was on fire with the cigarette smoke coming out. I'm just sitting there, keep looking in. <laughs> I mean, you could go in for about two or three minutes, but you, you, you're coming out. But I got to say this. Some of the greatest people, I'm telling you now, and I looked at my wife, I said, now think about this. They were so involved in what we were doing. And there weren't many people at this place. But they were so overwhelmed to be a part of what we were doing. Do you hear? And I looked at her. I said, church folks rejected this meeting. 
And we were standing holding the door open on a beer joint. And I'm hearing people saying, give me 20 tickets. I'll buy 100 because we were selling tickets because nobody showed up. We had rolls of tickets this big. By the end of the night, they bought every ticket we had. And then when they would win the money, they donated it back to Miles for Miles Foundation. I mean, I was amazed. But it's because it's in their heart to do that. Has something lied to the churches so long that we started off before we got saved where we would give and be generous and be kind? But once you get saved, you get shaped by a religious teaching and you become rigid and mean and, and nasty and now you can't relate to these people? Huh? <laughs> The Bible says, sanctify them with my word. So if you're standing in a place like that, you got a great opportunity. Number one, you don't beat people with the gospel. Just show them love. The young man, the man that come out and donated, he won $500. He come out and he gave it back to the, to the foundation. He was country. Now that cat was country. And he was running the karaoke thing. He was a mix between Keith Whitley and Randy Travis and Travis Tread. He had all of them going on. And he come out and said, I'm going to tell you, I don't go to church much as I should. But he said, I got a gift and I got a talent and I try to make people happy and bless them. And he said, that money means nothing to me. And I'm glad I can be a part of what you guys are doing. And, I'm, and he genuinely said, and I'm sorry for your loss. I do not know how you feel, but I want you to know I'm sorry to hear that. Man, I've had Christians come to me and say, how you feeling, buddy? Good. Things going well for you? Yeah. That's good. I need you to help me. See, we got the pleasantries out of the way. You get my I might as well say, how you doing? What do you want me to do for you? <laughs> well, being you asked, preacher. <laughs> Glory to God. So God says, I'm counting him worthy and faithful to preach the gospel in the ministry. Do you know that every born again person in here today, you're in a ministry? You're called to change lives. And those lives will be changed and off. You know, I think often the guys that are in India and the guys that are in China and the women that are over there giving their lives in, in places that are they're being beheaded and shot. And then, then you have your biker gangs. And then you have people. There's all sorts of Christians that are in, infiltrated into places that you and I will never go. But God's called them there. He called them there. And you and I might sit on the back, on the, on the sidelines and judge them, but God says, I'm going I'm to infiltrate you right into one of the biggest biker gangs in America, and I'm going to let you lead them to the Lord. I mean, one, one, you, you imagine all the hell's angels getting saved? And believe you me, just because of their title, them some good people. They're, they're wonderful people. And you don't, you mess with one? Think about it. We got gangs. If you mess with one, you mess with all. If you mess with a Christian, we say, well, we didn't really need him. <laughs> Sorry. But we got gangs that are more faithful than we are to each other. Huh? I mean, riding home last night, it's 30 degrees. We were trying to, we were racing home. But if we notice one bike would get too far back, we'd slow down and start pulling over because we don't know what happened. Now we got one in the gang that we've just got in our gang, our little four-pack gang or whatever we are, that uh, he tends to make a lot of mistakes right now. <laughs> <laughs> I tell him, I say, you got to keep the bike. He's got a, you know, he's got a little hot rod bike. I say, you got to keep the thing running at the red lights. I look in my mirror. He's got his hands down in the motor yesterday warming his hands. I said, I, this ain't good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Turn to Galatians. Everybody okay? We just kind of, thank you, Holy Spirit. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. I'm just obeying the Lord here. Amen. 
Galatians chapter 3. Man, 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 thank you, Holy Ghost. I love the word of the Lord. Let's look at verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by what? Now, we just read where Paul said the Lord deemed him faithful. This is before he had any Holy Ghost knock off your horse experience. He deemed him faithful. There's something in you that God put in you that he knows that when he taps into it, it'll come out every time. No matter how dark, no matter how bad, God has planted a seed in you that he knows when I grab on that thing that they're going to produce. Because the Bible says the vine cannot produce without the main branches. We are the vine, and we're going to produce. The just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Amen. Christ didn't just die for sins. He died for curse of sins. Sin brought curses in our life. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. We might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Hallelujah. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth it or added to it. So he's telling us here God cut a covenant and that whoever adds to or tries to take away is wrong. Right? I want you to think, get, get that in your head because some of us have had a lot of the covenant stole from you. Now think of it in terms of your family inheritance. When you go to the courthouse and you get those documents, whatever those documents say, that's what happens. Nobody can go to that courthouse and get the documents and read after a loved one has passed on and in that room begin to change that document. That document is sealed. That's what the law stands by. You can't change that document. Now, God's telling us here, you can't change the document that I cut with Abraham. Verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant was confirmed before of God in Christ. The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul or cancel or change or modify that it should make the promises of no effect. When did the law come? 430 years after the Lord visited with Abraham. What have we connected to? We connected to the law and disconnected from the blessing. For if the inheritance by of the, uh, be of the law, it is no more of the promise, but God gave it to Abraham as a promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So the law came to keep us on track that we don't lose the blessing, right? The law is nothing more than road signs. We've turned the law into our way of living a holy life. Back to what we said last Sunday, church has become a standard of do's and don'ts if I don't cuss, then I'm okay. If I don't do certain things, then I'm fine just like the rest of the world. But that's not the truth. The truth is you have to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, confess that he is Lord, be born again, and then you begin to walk in the statutes of the blessing of the Lord. But the enemy has, has blinded us to the blessings of Abraham and caught, let us connect to the law and legalism of what now we call church. Huh. 
If the law then against, verse 21, the promises of God, God forbid. For if there had been a law given which would have given life, really righteousness should have been by the law. Righteousness doesn't come by the law. You with me? But the scripture, now who, do, who have we decided the scripture is? Jesus. First John says, and he came and dwelt, the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the Shekinah glory of the Lord. The Bible says he come and made his tabernacle with us. It's called in the, in the Hebrew or in Greek, Mishkan. He come and Mishkan with us. He come and became our neighbor. He, he came and allowed his illuminating light to be seen by a dark world. That now he says, where you were no, were no, you were strangers to me. You were not in the covenant. You were outside of the promises of God and the blessings of Abraham. Because of me coming, I'm going to bring you in. And literally it means you can come in my tent. We talked about the hen. You come up under my wings now and I'll keep you through the blessings that I have released to Abraham as a promise and not by the law. Now what we're getting around to, there's, there's over 60 some promises that God promised Abraham. I dare say we don't live in one of them. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Mm. Wherefore, no. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Look at something with me. Look at Romans eleven thirty two. Romans eleven thirty two. Everybody got it. Let's look at verse uh, thirty. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. We have to establish who mercy is. It's God himself. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. And look at what he's talking about, mercy. How many of us needed mercy? Verse 32, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon them. Now turn back to verse 22, Galatians. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. It almost looks like God is saying he shut us up in sin till he came. Does it not? Hmm? But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Now we just read in Romans, it says that for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might show them mercy. How many has ever been in unbelief? Some of us may still be there. Just bear with me. I told you this is, this Holy Ghost talking to you. Now keep in mind the scripture where Paul said he found me faithful, deemed me faithful, and put me in the ministry. If we start talking church-related topics, our first line of defense say, I'm not good enough for that. I'm not worthy to do that. I'm not ever going to be able to be a, I, I don't mind serving, but I'll never be a preacher or whatever. You can't say that. You can't say that. And when you read this right here, he's telling us that God sent his son to die, that the blessing of Abraham would rest upon the Gentiles, and that the curses would be broken off of our life. We no longer have to live under a curse. But when you get down here, it says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. We're no longer under the law. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. 
For as many as you are, uh, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promises. Now, you have a God-given right. It says right here that the faith of Christ Jesus is what obtained it for us to start with. Then we have the opportunity to have faith in Christ Jesus in order to be a part of this covenant promises. But what bothers me here is when he says, I counted Paul worthy and faithful to be in the ministry before Paul ever done one thing other than kill people. And when you read this scripture, but the scripture has concluded all under sin, if we're deeming the scripture, which we read in the Bible, is Christ Jesus. It's saying that Christ Jesus put me in sin until his faith came. But that's not true. Because if we read that just like what we think it's saying here, it's telling us that Christ used instruments of the devil to keep us boxed in until he could come with his grace and mercy and give us an opportunity to get out. You with me? Which kind of will lead to that I can get out of sin sometime without Christ. If I just be good, I can get out on my own. But you can't. And it's saying the scripture, which is Jesus, has concluded or deemed everybody under sin or in sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So it's saying to me, in my natural mind, God put me in sin purposely. Is that what you're seeing? I'm, I'm in sin. And until Christ comes, I can't get out of the sin because he used the devil's tactics to keep me bound down. Right? You with me? Why would he use the devil's tactics to put me in sin? That's not what this scripture is saying to us. When God says, I called you before the foundation of the world, he called each and every one of you, and he looks at you and sees you just the way he called you. He has never changed his mind. He has never changed the call. He will never detour from it. We can break fellowship, but God never breaks relationship with you. And what this scripture is really telling us, the word conclude in the Greek says that, that something enclosed us on all four sides to keep us to the promise came. And reading this scripture, you think it's sin. But we just read in Romans where he said that I concluded them all in unbelief by my mercy. And I, uh, I gave them mercy. And I showed them mercy. And I'm going to extend them mercy. Even though they were in unbelief, I'm giving them something they didn't get on their own. Somebody has to give you something in order for you to get it. And God's saying, while they were in unbelief, I still extended mercy to them. This word here says, enclosed on all four sides under sin or that we're in sin. But that's not what it reads in the Greek. At all. It's telling us where we were at. When God came and God says, I closed you in on all four sides with mercy so that sin wouldn't overtake you until you obtained the promises as you confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see that? So God still invested in us so much that he says, I didn't enclose you in on sin. Satan did. But when I came and the word came and the scripture came, it brought mercy that took mankind and boxed us in it. Because without God's mercy, we'd all be burning in hell today. Every one of us. So God says that I'm going to send my son, born in the flesh, the scripture. Remember in, in, in Genesis, it says in the word, and, and Abraham saw Christ's day. That, 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 that it talks about that the Lord taught with Abraham and showed him the days that would come. 
The Lord showed him things with Isaac that was going to happen. And when God walked around in that blood and recited that covenant while Abraham was in a suspended state, God said, let this be that if any of these words fall null and void, that I myself fall. And that's what he's telling, Paul's telling us here. This covenant that God cut with Abraham can't be null and void, that this is what I'm going to do, that I'm going to box mankind in mercy where Satan's trying to kill them with sin, I will create a box of mercy by me because of Jesus Christ, the scripture, becoming flesh, and he died. And now there's an unseen force in the universe called the grace and mercy of God Almighty that keeps men and women that don't even know God exists, but he boxes you in while Satan's constantly trying to kill, steal, and destroy where the church has switched that around and said, now God's doing the killing. God's doing the destroying. God's doing the destruction. And that's not true. God said, without my mercy, the world would be burned up in a day. But because of the mercy of God that boxed me in on all four sides when I was not a believer and the devil said, I'm going to kill him before his time. I'm going to murder him before he calls on your name. God said, no, you won't because I'm going to box him in with mercy that before you you touch him, he'll call upon my name and he's a chosen vessel that I counted worthy to put in the ministry before I was ever worthy to speak a word of the Bible out of my mouth and that goes to you and that goes to me. God's mercy, God's grace, God's kindness, God's truth. When you got a God of the universe that says, I counted you, I considered you, I deemed you worthy of the call of the Most High God through my son Jesus that will die for you. Do you hear me, church? And on that thing ringing over in my spirit, that it counted me worthy to be in the ministry that was formerly a blasphemer, an adulterer, a murderer. And Paul's got a long list of what he did. And he goes right out of giving what he did, and he looks at a man he was training in the, in the spirit, and he said, you make a good war by the prophecies I spoke over you, son. What was he reminding him of? You're called to. You've been set aside also. And there will be other voices that will come around and try to infiltrate your heart and mind through your ears. But you stir up the gift of God in you and you remember what I said to you, son. And you remember what you saw me do. And this is what Paul was reminding Timothy of. Don't you let anything. And he goes on to mention two names and there's some have become shipwrecked in their faith. How easy is it today to say, well, church is just, it don't take all that. It's very easy in the society we live in. Hmm? Very easy to get in the flow of things. I was glad Joe yelled out at the parade, glory to God and bless Jesus. Make you feel funny if you're not all the way in there. Because it's not politically correct. But church, every one of you are a chosen vessel. And I'm going to tell you, God's got his stamp on you. Now, you can go do something else for the world. You can run and let religion and old condemnation beat you up, but that's not God. God's give you mercy, and God's extended grace to you to finish your course and to finish your race. You are vitally important to him. And in so doing, this is where we see signs, wonders, and miracles that the, that the world has long forgot. I sit down, and God reminded me this morning. I sat down with an 89-year-old man about probably 15 years ago. How long? Let's see. Probably to know, probably about 2005. Nope. Six. I met a man in his 80s. He, heard, he saw me in a mall talking to someone, and he overheard my conversation. Watch out who overhears your conversation. Saved over here. Was it? Is that the electric slide or whatever we used to call it? <laughs> Not saved over here because they hear that mouth. 
And somebody was asking me questions in a store, and they were contradicting some truth. I said, you know, we go, I don't know, you know, you're going to get mad like all the other really. No, I said, no, it's not true. The Holy Spirit will give you a, a spirit of meekness. And I began to expound. And I love when the wisdom of the Lord, kind of like today, uh, I had my, my brothers got a message together to speak, speak today. The Lord said, get up and do, do Timothy. I said, that's it. I, all I got is First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He said, what else do you need? <laughs> I said, I need a lot right now. <laughs> and I was sharing with a, with a group that he heard. And they were amazed because they were very intellectual people. And they were explaining the way the Bible in the middle of a store. I said, that's not correct. I said, God's got power. The Holy Spirit's real. He's not an it. He's not a thing. He's not a something. He's a person. I said, he's a person, and I honor him. And this man was over in the corner. When I got done and went to walk out, he said, sir, you mind if I speak to you? I said, no. He said, I've never heard anybody stand up for the gospel like that, at, that they know what they're saying. I said, well, I really don't. I said, the whole, now I said, I couldn't redo it if I wanted to. The Holy Spirit did that. He said, will you come by my house? Well, you wonder. <laughs> we do live in a crazy world. Like, well, does he like me? <laughs> and we begin to talk. And our, immediately the Bible says your spirit will bear witness. And it did. And I went to this man's house. And he began to share with me. He had no idea who I was. He called, excuse me, he got my number. He called me the following day. He said, God said to tell you to come to my house. I have something for you. I said, where do you live? He said, I live in Cherry Grove. I drove down to the man's house, and he had a Dake's Bible. I never even heard of a Dake's Bible. Big old thing. He said, God told me to go buy this and give it to you, that you would use it and do far more than I ever had done in my life. But God said for me to sow a seed into your life and to give you this Bible because you needed it. And I opened it up and began to look at it, and I was amazed because it's a wonderful Bible. If you want a good study Bible, Dake's Bible's good. I know it's not King James. You won't go to hell if you read it. You'll be all right. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Is it King James? No. Did you know King James? <laughs> My God, just get you a Bible you can read. And we begin to share stories. And he said one thing. He was 89 years old. He said, the one thing I've seen the church, this was in 2006 or 7, he said, the church has lost its power. They've lost their desire for the things of the Lord. And he began to weep in his house. He said, I know I don't have, my days are numbered now. But he said, I'm going to finish. He said, but you know what? And he began to cry. He said, I was called to preach the gospel. And I didn't out of, I felt like I was not worthy. He said, I'm 89 years old, and I can't get back the years that I could have stood and did what God asked me to do. He said, my heart's grieved every day. He said, but I've been in meetings, and he told me. He said, I was in a meeting, and some of you know Kenneth Hagin, if you've ever did any great man of God. He said, I was standing in a meeting and, was, and knew the man personally, sitting on the front row. He said, I watched that man begin to preach under the power of God, and he took six steps out in the midair while he preached and turned around. He never knew he'd done it. Walked off the stage, he said, and, ne and walked to the first row of chairs and turned around and walked back probably at least six to ten feet. He said, I watched it with my own eyes. But he said, there was a Shekinah glory in that building, and people began to get healed. And devils begin to come out of people. People begin to get out of wheelchairs. Now, that's what you call a sign and a wonder. I see, you know, a man walking in midair, I mean, that's going to mess you up. But you know what it is by the anointing in the room. Why have we, when God has deemed you a chosen vessel, worthy and faithful of a calling, to advance the kingdom of God. Forget the name of the church. That is your job. Advance the kingdom of God in your home, in your family, in your community, in your children, in your spouse, at your job. But if we've all deemed that God's a bad God that's concluded us in sin 
and that when mistakes come, he punishes us, then we never serve God to the fullness because we think God has nothing to offer us. How many people you talk with today will say, yeah, well, I've been to church. I've done that. That's great. And right away, you should know where they've been. You've been to a dead religious aunt and uncle owned church. That's it. That's it. My aunt, my uncle, mama and them, grandma and them helped us, and that's it. They, if the Holy Spirit showed up and said, I'll do miracles here, well, let me ask Aunt May. If it's going to be all right. Literally. When Jesus said, I've sent a comforter, I've sent a counselor, I've sent a paraclete, I've sent one that is dunamis power, that when you get this thing, this is the thing about the Holy Ghost. It says he's dunamis, which is a dynamo. That means when this thing gets to churning, the more it churns, the, the faster it'll get, and you can't stop it. You can't just put the brakes on it and slow it down. But have we ever even let him turn over one time in our lives? I read something this week that I found that I thought I'd lost. It was a Father's Day poster. And each one of my kids wrote up several things and po put on that poster. And Miles had put on there, I love your stories. They make me laugh. And then over in the corner, he put another one. You work harder than anybody I know, Daddy, at helping people. You deserve the best. And then on another one, he said, you have changed my life. You're my hero. People, whether you know it or not, in a small, some way, Jesus deems you a hero. And you have a right. Now I always say that a man that can impact his house is a first line of defense. You should impact your house before you impact anybody else. It's easy to talk it. You got to walk it. And that, those little phrases, even though they hurt, they helped me get through the week. Because in my eyes, his word mattered more than all. Because those were the words as a young man, when I said, when I have children, the one thing they'll remember in this life is that I serve God. No matter what people say and what stories follow me, my children will know they got a father that serves God. Amen. And secondly, you have a right to show the world. How does God reveal himself? Through his chosen vessels. How does God get people healed? Through his chosen vessels. How does God expand the kingdom? Through his chosen vessels. How does God help you? He gives you mercy and grace for all things that you ever face in this life. And let me tell you something. You can't use it up. You will never use it up. I would rather step out and fail and know I trusted God than stay back and do nothing. And I face him one day and he have to ask me, son, why did you not do what I asked you? Because I counted you faithful when you knew nothing about being faithful. Amen? Stand to your feet.